Ah yes, Friday in Dublin, you can't beat it. Teeming with rain, horrendous traffic problems, because I just had a phone call from a friend of mine. I can't actually show you. Well, I suppose I can sort of show you. I'm outside Dublin Zoo. Now, I'm not willing to take the umbrella away, so just keep watching me for a second, folks, and then I'll, I'll shut up and give you a better look around. But yes, I'm outside Dublin Zoo. Now, I had a wonderful plan to speak to the man who's about to arrive, but unfortunately, he's stuck in traffic and I'm stuck in the rain. I had intended starting here at the old entrance to Dublin Zoo, which is the entrance that all Dublin kids back in my time, back in the 50s, would have said, you know, they would have entered the zoo here on the annual trip to the zoo, because that's where you went. You were going to the zoo for a great day. But uh, unfortunately, this entrance has been closed for quite a few years. The new one is just down the road there, about 70 or 80 yards down the road, and I'll show you that as well. But the man I'm about to meet, who is still unfortunately stuck in traffic, worked here in the zoo for many, many years. And he's gonna tell us all about it if he gets out of the traffic. So I'll talk to you in a few minutes, folks. Now, as I said a moment ago, I'm outside the old entrance to Dublin Zoo. You can just see a little bit of the thatched roof up there. And at some stage in the future, when the hoarding is not around it, we'll come back and have another look. There is still an entrance at this spot, a more modern entrance. And it's just coming into view now. That's for annual ticket holders, members of the zoo, or people who book online. There are two different paying desks there. And about 70 or 80 yards down the road, as I said, is the newer entrance. And we'll have a closer look at that at some stage. But for now, I'll just hang around and wait for my friend to come along. And then he'll tell you a little about his time working in the zoo. Okay, as I said, folks, I'm here at Dublin Zoo and I was waiting for an old pal. Well, he's arrived. This is Jerry Creighton and everybody in Ireland knows Jerry, the face of Dublin Zoo or rather he used to be, because in a minute he's gonna tell me all about his new job. But first, Jerry, tell me your history here in Dublin Zoo. She has got a long, long history, an incredible, an incredible family, uh, family history. Like Jerry Senior, uh, my father, was here for 50, over 50 years, like as a big cat keeper and senior curator for animals. He was my inspiration, like as a kid growing up, like he had incredible knowledge of animals. Uh, you know, and as a kid, like it was very different. We we came from a local area, Ivor Street, which was. Um, and as a kid, I was able to come up to the zoo with my father holding his hand practically, and it was an amazing education. It was a wonderful little life experience. So I couldn't wait to get out of school. I went to Brunner, um, as they call it, down in um, you know Brunswick Street, and I couldn't wait to get into the zoo to start my zoo career. So I started like you know 14, 15, like my father. He used to have a pony, a pony round around the zoo, working with the ponies in the pet's corner. And then eventually, I, I got, at 16, I got a trainee keeper job, which was incredible. And then I worked as a trainee keeper. Then I worked as, um, you know, assistant with the, with, with sitting all the big keepers, with the elephants, with other animals. Then I became a team leader. And then I finished up as operations manager. And then, like, you know, I, I, I've been in the zoo for 37 years and I'm still like a consultant here at the zoo, which is very important to me. The historical association for me and my family has to stay that way. But um, I, I decided then that I wanted to go globally. I have a huge passion for elephants. You know, and elephants have got a bad deal in, in zoos for uh, many, many years. The biggest animal in the world and they were kept in the smallest spaces. We didn't understand their biology, their physiology, how they live, how they function. And um, this kind of struck a real chord with me that I could actually make a difference globally for elephants. 
So, you know, about over a year and a half ago, I set up my own company, Global Elephant Care, and um, I had already had been traveling to, to many zoos around the world on, on with the support of Dublin Zoo. But, um, you know, it was taking up Dublin Zoo resources, and it was a thing I always wanted to do. I wanted to become, you know, an Irish man that's been the voice of the elephants. And um, the zoo was fo so supportive, gave me great support on, on wanting to do that. And now, like, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm working as a consultant globally. Melbourne Zoo, just to name a few. Cincinnati, Dallas Zoo. Uh, Howlitz is, I'm working on Howlitz Zoo at the moment, which is a magnificent project. It's the first time I'm working with African elephants and I'm bringing back 13 elephant Africans to Kenya to be released from a zoo situation back to the wild. It's the first time it's ever been done and it'll be remarkable. Jerry, having said that you work with African elephants, I seem to remember way back you telling me a story that the elephants in the zoo are actually Indian elephants, Asian yeah, elephants. Correct, we have the Asian or Indian elephants here in Dublin Zoo and that's more for a conservation based reason. There's less than 30 or 40,000 uh, of uh, the Asian elephant left in the wild. But the African elephant was over in the millions, but there's less than 350,000 African elephants left in the wild. So from a conservation perspective, the Asians need more support from the zoos. But like this is, like, this is the sad thing, like in our conversation, which will last 10 or 15 minutes, there's probably gonna be two African elephants killed in that duration. Every 15 minutes, there's an African elephant killed for ivory. It's just ridiculous and they need that support. Unfortunately, the countries that they come from, and this is not to sound disrespectful, but you know, in Africa, the, 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 there's lawlessness, there's lack of structure, and the elephants are the ones that are suffering. Wonderful stuff, Jerry. Now, you also told me you're off to England next week to train some elephants. Tell me about that. Yeah, when we say train, and it's very important that people understand what training means. It's not like people have this uh, interpretation like many years ago, like of circus elephants. We don't do that. What we do is we train. You got an animal, big guy, five, six ton, female, three to four ton. So you can't really push these, push them around. But using positive reinforcement, it's, uh, it's like two target sticks we use. You touch the elephant's head, you give him a piece of apple. You start that process and the elephant says, every time I touch that piece, of, that piece of stick, I get an apple. So what you do is it's called positive reinforcement. You can train them to present their ear for blood draws or foot for pedicures. And then what I'm doing is training these elephants both physically and psychologically for their, to go into the, the, the cargo crates and the travel crates that they will travel on an aircraft back to Kenya. So we're preparing them. You, you know, you, you, no drugs, no sedatives. That's all anachronistics, it's all old. It's modern, it's modern philosophy, it's modern training, but the core of the elephant wellness comes to the front front. That we care about them and we give them this opportunity to accept this, okay, this is okay, I've been here before, I've been in this crate, all is good, I know it's going to be okay. So it's about preparation and it's the height of animal excellence and animal care. Okay, Jerry. so when they arrive in the Masai Mara or Amboseli, probably Amboseli actually. It, no, it's a place called Shimba Hills. In, oh, in Shimba Kenya. Hills, yeah. okay. A place I don't know about. When they arrive back in Shimba Hills, how does your training help them back to the wild? Well, the, the training has allowed them to be psychologically prepared for the journey. So when they come out with the crates and the travel crates on the other side, there's no stress. They've done it. And then immediately they can start interacting with the environment. And this will be a slow release. It's not that they're going to be just thrown out of a crate and left into the wild. They will be a habit, they will be allowed to have its way to the area. It could take many, many months. You know, it could take quite a while. And uh, they will be in a 50 acre zone first before they're re reintroduced to the wild where they're learning about the environment. They're learning how to adapt, you know, climatically, physically, nutritionally to, to the whole. So it's a very complex planning and strategy to make this a success. Jerry, listen, we had planned on something totally different, but the weather turned against us and the traffic, obviously. So I'm only going to ask you one more question. I remember this is nothing to do with elephants. Okay. The first time you and I met, which is, well, you can correct me time, was it about 15 or 16 years yeah, ago? Yeah, at least. Yeah. You had Lucy living with you. That's right, yeah. Okay, do you want to tell folks Lucy about Lucy? Lucy was an amazing experience because what happened with Lucy, like, she was a baby chimpanzee. And our mother um, was a first time mother and she rejected her. 
Now that's very natural for first time mothers. Statistically in the wild, that happens over 90%. So the baby dies, but it, it, it's about reproductively getting the female to start off. So what happens is like, they're not like we don't, they don't have the moral comfort of humans. The young female in the chimpanzee society comes into estrus, she gets mated by the male, then she has something to offer the group. So the male looks after them. It's, it's, a, it's a complex structured situation. But um, Lucy's mom wasn't capable of rearing her. She was confused. And anyway, we took her home up to Cabra. She lived in Cabra like for nearly yeah, 16 months. Not a penny children's allowance that I get. But anyway, we'll talk about that another day. But you know, but she was like having a human baby, like the chimpanzee, the genetics, the behaviour. She was incredible. Like she used to come in and out to the zoo in a baby seat. My wife, like Leona, would just mind her every evening. She'd sit there, feed her. For hygiene reasons, we had her in a baby in nappies. And she had a bottle, and like, you know, she used to jump into the bed at, you know, between us, and you know, for a, for a cuddle. But it, it, it's about their behaviour, and it's about the importance of the genetics of understanding that this was the best example of how she could live, because she wasn't with her family. So socially, they need a structure like we have as humans. And then before she was two years old, which is the island just behind us, I introduced her back to her, to her family, which was usually successful. But every day, as a baby, I used to bring her in. Um, under my arm, I was feeding the other chimps, and you hear the sights and sounds, and the introduction was successful. So, you know, it was very important because chimps need chimps. They won't learn nothing from Jerry and Cabra. They need <laughs> to learn from chimpanzees. So, it was very important that that happened. And it was a great success and a great introduction. So, where is she now? She's actually in Poland now in a successful breeding group. And I've been over there to see her once or twice, and she looks amazing. Okay, well, maybe I'll get over it soon. Absolutely. Like. Jerry, great. listen, thanks for this afternoon. Hopefully when we get here in a couple of weeks time, we'll have a walk around and you can tell me a little bit well, more. Well listen, we're in an amazing bio park, it's lashing rain, but look around us, look at the plants and that's why it's happening. So the next time we do it, we'll have a good chat, but I hope you enjoyed the chat today and thanks for asking me on. Thanks for watching Wildlife Wednesday folks. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, I'd be grateful if you'd give it a like and subscribe to my channel. And when you do, don't forget to ring the bell so you're notified every time I upload new content. If you'd like to buy a copy of my safari book from sunrise to sunset, follow the link below the video. In the meantime, take care, stay safe. We're not quite out of the woods with COVID yet, but we're almost there, so take all the precautions that you can. Till next week, take care, stay safe, bye.